please turn with me uh, to Isaiah chapter 45. And then we're going to start a, a new series, which is kind of piggybacking off of everything else we've been studying the last year or so. Isaiah 45. I'm going to start in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the lions of the king, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut into sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of the secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Now, if you told, turn over to chapter, uh, the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 25. And I will restore to you the years... Somebody say the years. Years. Not just days, not just months, but the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the pommel worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt, dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Father God, we just thank you for your word, Lord God. Father, I thank you that when you've promised something, Lord God, that it's just not an empty promise, Father. But, Lord God, you are able to perform that which you have promised, Father. And, Lord, I just pray a blessing over each and every life that's in this place. Lord, that not only would there be a shifting in their life, God, but you would be just begin to lift off stuff, Lord God, that they have carried around, Lord God, for years and years and years, Lord God. Father, that deliverance, Lord, is close to them, Father God. Lord, that you will open up doors that no man can shut, Father God. Lord, that you will transform their lives, that you will bring them, Lord God, into a new place, Lord God. Father, I just ask you, God, that you would just give us ears to hear tonight and eyes to see what your spirit is saying, Lord God. And Father, that you would just touch each and every person that's in this place, Lord God. Every person that is stuck or feels trapped, Lord God. Father, that you would give them the momentum that they need to just begin to, to push forward, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, God gave me the, this, this, uh, this, the name of the series because it's called Breaking Confinement. And as much as I see people um, growing in the Lord and God is doing some awesome things in our life, um, have you ever felt like you're kind of like that, that, that hamster on the treadmill that's just kind of going around and around and around and around and around and you are, you are moving but you are not progressing? <laughs> Um, it, it's almost like you just kind of feel you're, you're enclosed, you, you're doing everything you know how to do. Um, you know, you, you're, you're tithing, you're serving, you're, you're worshiping, you're coming to church, you're studying the Word. And it just seems like, you know, for years now, I'm just in the same place. Okay. Um, and, I, and I sense that on your lives, and, and I think that's something that everybody goes through. And, and the Lord really dealt with me a, a few weeks ago, and, and you know, He was talking to me about. Everybody was talking about the shift, the shift, the shift that we've got to, you know, shift, and we do. And, and shifting is great if you shift up. <laughs> However, um, if you're one of those people, if you've ever experienced that you've had unexpected company, and somebody says, "I'm, I'm coming over," and and the house is not quite right, you know, what happens is you'll you'll take your stuff. And you take it from one room and you shift it into another room because you don't want to throw anything out because you're not really sure um, as to what it is because you've got to move quick. And the problem with that spiritually is sometimes when we shift stuff and we're doing lateral shifting, we're taking the same stuff and we've just shifted it into a different place, but the same stuff is there. Nothing has changed. Can anybody identify with that? Amen. Okay. Um, the Lord spoke to me a few weeks back, 
And he said, Karen, I'm not, I'm not going to do a shift anymore. He says, I'm going to do a lift. I'm going to do a lift. I'm, I'm going to take some stuff off your life. And I want you to tell my people that I'm going to take it off of their life as well. Because what happens is the enemy has had you confined or, or contained <laughs> in this place. And basically, if you're really honest, you'll say, you know, it's kind of like I've just shifted from the pit to the prison to the pit to the prison. Back and forth, back and forth, but I've never really gotten to the palace. And when you have a season of Job like that, that lasts so long, you can begin to think or have the delusion, and I'll call it a delusion because God's word says that that's not, that's not your destiny, and you have that delusion that, well, maybe, maybe this is my, my sentence. Maybe this season is going to be my sentence, and I'm just going to go back and forth um, from the pit to the prison, and things are really not going to get better. I mean, sometimes they'll get a little bit better. You'll get a little bit relief, but let's face it, I haven't gotten to the palace. And your destiny, according to what the Word of God says, is your destiny is at the palace. He says, I'm going to broaden you know, your borders. I'm going to expand your, your territory. He says to us, you are the head and you are not the tail. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. So it's not just it's not just an abundant life. It's, it's more abundant. So God's, God's will and God's desire for us is to be truly blessed. When you read the word of God and what he says about his children, we're the head and we're not the tail. We're above and we're not beneath. He said we're going to be blessed wherever we go. If we're in the country, if we're in the city, you know, wherever we go, we should be blessed. And I think a lot of times we're struggling because my reality is not what I'm seeing. You know, what I'm seeing in the spirit is not what my reality is showing me. And um, God wants you to know that, you know, he wants you, to, he wants you to experience that abundant life. And he wants you to experience it spiritually, physically, financially, and, and, and ministry. And you know what? I see people. I see people. They're confined. They're like trapped financially, spiritually. No matter how much, no matter how much I work, I'm still making that same that same paycheck. Every month there seems to be more month than there is money. Amen? <laughs> um, but here's the thing. The word confinement, it means the state of being physically constrained. In other words, trapped. And the God that we serve is a God of movement. He's a God of prosperity. He is a God of peace. So when you're stuck in a place like this, you've got to understand one thing. This is not his permanent will for your life. Amen? Amen. The Bible also tells us that um, we perish for a lack of knowledge. And sometimes there's stuff that we're going through because we don't understand what's happening spiritually. The enemy has a field day with our minds. Amen? So the enemy and this thing called confinement, confinement. It's really important that we do not give the enemy more credit or praise than he deserves. What do I mean by that? Well, when I keep saying, you know, the enemy did this and the enemy did that and I'm, I'm sick in my body and we keep, we keep talking about the problem, we keep talking about the situation and what the enemy has done to us, in essence, we're acknowledging him for everything, okay? Giving him too much, too much credit. And listen, the truth be told, there are storms that sometimes we give the devil, the devil credit for that God himself has ordained and has sent us into. Does God really do that? Yes. He knew the storm was coming for the disciples. And what did he do? He sent them right out there in the middle of a storm. Why? To grow them, to teach them. To prove that he that he can be trusted in the midst of the storm. 
And I will tell you, I thank God for storms and trials and all of that because it's in those places that I've really learned. I, I've really never had much growth on a mountaintop. The only thing that's great about the mountaintop is that there's just some relief. But all the lessons and all the strength that you get in your life comes from the valley. It comes from the difficult place. Why? Because you're learning how to fight the battles. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, while we can't give the devil too much credit and praise, we've got to find a balance because the Bible is very clear that we do have an adversary who is roaming and roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may desire. Now, Jesus talked about the enemy. He said, there is a devil. He's the father of all lies. The lie, the truth is not in him. Even Jesus was tempted. He was brought, you know, into the desert and, and he was tempted by the enemy. So there is an enemy that is definitely out there. And you've got to find the balance between, I don't have to fear the enemy, but I need to be aware that he's there and what he's doing. And I say that because, again, a lot of people are running around and there's a demon under every rock. They're blaming the devil for everything and sometimes it's our own flesh, it's our own stupidity. Sometimes God has ordained trials. He says, listen, I, I'm the one who creates the havoc. In Isaiah, he says that. He says, I'm the one who fans into flame and creates the havoc. Because sometimes there's gotta be a bad storm because if you study storms, Storms come in, and when they go out, they actually clean up the atmosphere. They actually bring order out of the chaos. Amen? So the enemy is real, but we don't have to fear him. And God declared that we are his children, that he has called us by name, and whatever weapon that the enemy has formed against us, and you have to know that there is a weapon that has been designed to take you out, to try to destroy you. But God says, listen... I'm not caught off guard by that. I'm not upset by that. I'm not threatened by that. Why? Because I'm God and I've, wrote, I've, I've written the pages of your book. I am the author and the finisher of your faith. So there is a balance that we need to look at and understand that we know that there's an enemy. We need to know how he thinks and how he works. Why is that important? They do that in the natural. When people go into the military, they send spies into other countries that are enemies to see how they live, how they think, what their culture is, and it makes them easier to capture because we know their every move. So it's not that, and I'm, and I'm amazed that there are, uh, there are some Christians that absolutely do not believe that there, isn't, that there is a devil. And there is. We don't have to fear him, but believe you me, he is doing everything he can to try to trip you and I up. Um, so, if we can understand how the enemy works, what he uses against us, if we can identify his schemes, because how many know that when you're going through something, what's the first thing that happens? You get confused. What, what's going on with this? But if you can learn how to spiritually discern the enemy and his tactics and can discern the truth from the lie, your battles are gonna be less fierce. Not to say that there's not going to be a battle because there's always going to be a battle. If you think that the enemy is just gonna lay down and say, well, I lost her, I lost him, they're too strong in the Lord, uh, I'll just leave them alone. That's not gonna happen, okay? And you can't lie to yourself. But you've got to be aware. You gotta be aware of, of how the enemy works. So there are some things that we need to understand about the enemy. First of all, the devil has no power over you than that which you give him. How do I give the enemy power? Well, I give the enemy power when I come into agreement with his lies. Every time that I am told a lie, I am told a bad report, and I come into agreement and I believe that lie, I'm coming into agreement with the enemy. The power of agreement, it works both ways. It can work in a positive way and it can work in a, in, a, in a negative way as well. And here's the thing we have to understand as mature believers. If God has not said it, 
if God did not declare it over your life, you do not have to receive it. You do not have to receive it. So many times people think, well, I'm a Christian, so I need to be polite, and I can't, I can't, I can't disagree, and I, I've got to, you know, if somebody prophesies something over me, or says something to me, or comes up and says, you know, the Lord told me to tell you. Listen, this is where Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and another, they will not follow. This is why it's important for you and I to be in the Word, to know what God has said about your situation. Because I can tell you, the enemy never works in black and white. He always works in shades of gray. He will never tell you a blatant lie, but he will mix the lie with the truth and make it gray so that you can say, okay, uh, that kind of sounds right or I can understand that. This is why you've got to be in the Word of God and know what God has said. And listen, God has set a table before you, and the enemy has set a table before you as well. And the menu for the devil's reception is fear, depression, anger, resentment, intimidation, manipulation, sickness, confusion, stress, and death. The menu for God's reception is love. Power, a sound mind, peace, healing, prosperity, protection, and life. I want you to remember this. Not every invitation that you receive, you have to accept. You don't have to receive every invitation. When you are a grown-up, God says, listen... See, the devil, he says, you have no choice. You become a slave to him. But God says, listen, you're not a slave. You're a child. You're my son. You're my daughter. And every day, because you're my son and my daughter, I set before you a choice. I set before you life, and I set before you death. You have to choose. You have to choose whose report you're going to believe. You have to choose Whose invitation are you going to receive? And sometimes people, you know, even in the natural, oh, I got to, I got to take this, I got to go to this wedding, I got to go to this party, I got to go to this dinner. I was invited. I feel bad. Listen, there are some places that you are just not meant to go. Doesn't make those other people bad. But if God doesn't call you, and God says, listen, I don't want you there, you don't have to accept that invitation. And so much of the battle that we face is that we settle and we accept things that God himself has not ordained for us to accept. Amen. And that's why I'm saying not everything that happens is the enemy's fault. Because God says, listen, if you're reading my word, you understand my blueprint. You understand what life is. You understand that holiness is not just about not not drinking and not smoking and not doing drugs and, 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 and not fornicating and not stealing. Holiness, true holiness, is birthed out of a relationship with your Heavenly Father. Come on now. That's what holiness is. It's not the things you do. Now listen, if, if you love the Lord, He says, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Yeah. You're going to do what I said to do, and you're not going to do what I told you not to do. That's just the way it is. He said it. He set it up. And the choice is ours. So you don't have to accept every single invitation. And listen, the devil will confine you and trap you when you think you don't have a choice. The scariest thing in life is when you think you don't have a choice. When you are being made to do something. When you know something's wrong. You remember what it was like being a kid? And the peer pressure. I know this is wrong. I know I shouldn't be doing it. But I feel like I have no choice because I'm afraid of what people are gonna think. I'm afraid of offending this one. I'm afraid of the consequences. And listen, God said, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. That if I listen to God's voice and I choose to be on the side of the Lord, guess what? 
my life is going to be blessed. So remember, every day, God sets before you and I a choice. Choose life or choose death. The second, the way the enemy um, wants to confine us is, he's, is, is that your life will follow your words and your actions. Amen. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. If you really want to know what you believe, you really know what, where you want to know where you stand with God and where you really, just listen to yourself speak. Just listen to yourself speak. And your life, listen, you know, people always ask, is this a sin? Is that a sin? I want to tell you that God will forgive and God can forgive every sin. He will. Okay? Because when we go and we repent, he says, I take, I take your sin, I throw it as far as the east is from the west. But God will not bless what he does not permit. He will forgive you, but he will not bless what he doesn't permit. And when you choose to sin, when you, you, you choose to confine yourself and can't move. Why are you preaching like this, Karen? Very simple. If the word of God says that I can have something, and, and, I, and I sang that song, Taking It Back, how bad do you really want it? I want everything that God has for me. Yes. You know, sometimes you, you got to really listen to the words of these songs. How bad do you really want it? I want everything. Amen. I really believe. God says, listen, you resist the devil, he will flee. And I want everything, everything God's promised me. Not that I deserve it, not that I've earned it, but if God wants me to have it, I want it. So if I'm not living there, and I'm not experiencing it, I know that there's nothing wrong with God. There's nothing wrong with God. God does not make mistakes. God does not make a promise to you or to me that he does not intend to keep. Amen. But God cannot bless what he doesn't permit. You cannot have promises if you don't have principles. Now God, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will work with you. He will pick you up every time you fall. He will dust you up. He will give you another chance. But if we don't start to make the right choices, if we don't start accepting the right invitations, we are going to be confined to where we are right now. And I don't know about you, but I am tired of being confined. If God has promised me something, I want what God has promised. I don't want to live in the permissive will of God. I want to live in the perfect will of God. And if that means that I've got to die to myself, and I've got to give up things that make me happy, that make me comfortable, then so be it. So if that's you and you want out of the space that you're in and you want to really truly experience this abundant life and you want to stop shifting from the pit to the prison, come on, I'd like six months just in the palace. Okay? Because I know, I know going from glory to glory to glory to glory and every glory there's always a dip before the glory. You're always going down before you're going up. There's always a bad season before a good season. Okay? There's always sowing before there is reaping. Come on. So I just want out of this place that I'm at. So I've really been like David, search me, oh God. And as I've been asking him, he's been showing me things and telling me things. Okay, So God does not bless what he doesn't permit. He will forgive you. But again, we're only getting half the blessing. Because forgiveness... Is just half the blessing. It's a great blessing. But why spend time always having to ask for forgiveness? Don't you want to move on yes. and start receiving blessing? Yes. You know, 
um, I believe the Bible talks about generational curses, and I think it goes up to four generations that a generation can be cursed. But when it talks about generational blessings, God says, I'll bless you up to a thousand generations. A thousand generations. That means a thousand generations beyond your lifetime. Your children's children, children's children, children. I mean, it'll just for a thousand generations. Don't you want to live under a generational blessing? Yeah. That's what I want. <coughs> so, and there's something else to understand about the enemy. The enemy will never, ever cripple you or paralyze you completely. He will never totally just wipe you out and take you out. Because first of all, he can't. Amen. He can't. There's, there, is, there is a hedge that is around you. He cannot destroy you. However, he can wound you and mess with your mind just enough to lay you up. He can't paralyze you, but he can maim you a little bit. He can break your arm. He can break your leg so that you walk with a limp. Not totally out because if it was totally... Listen, if you saw a dog and the dog was growling and drooling from the mouth, if you have any common sense, you're not going by that dog. I don't care how much you love animals. If you're not trained... You are not going by an animal that's growling at you. Because it's too obvious. I'm going to get bit. You know, the enemy knows that you're not stupid. So he's not going to come at you. you got to understand, he's cunning. He's sneaky. So what he does is he uses cute little dogs. <laughs> you know those little ones? That, that, you know, that, that you just want to hug and you want to kiss them, but sometimes they can yap and they can bite and they can be more vicious. Why? Because you're not expecting it. And he'll only break your arm or break your leg because he wants to confuse you. Because if he totally paralyzes and takes you out, it's so obvious that it's attack from the enemy. But if he can maim me a little bit and hurt me, then I could start thinking, maybe it's something I did. Maybe I deserve this. Maybe this is God's will for my life. Or sometimes when you've gone from tragedy to tragedy to tragedy, or from sickness or battle to battle to battle, you can, the enemy can mess with your mind and say, well, I guess this is my, this is God's will for my life. That I'll never be on top, that God's ordained me to suffer. And there's a whole mentality out there that truly believes that. The problem with it, it goes so against God's word. Is this helping you tonight? Yes. Yes. Okay. So thirdly, the enemy is... Oh, okay, That's, that was the point I was making. So thirdly, he doesn't totally take you out. He just maims you a little bit to give you some, some confusion. Because here's the thing, too. Sometimes when it's the big tragedies in life, death and sickness, those things are... I always found for myself, it was easier for me to come to terms and give when my heart was broken, my brother and my father died, to kind of give that to the Lord because I knew it was out of my hands. There was nothing, nothing I did to make that happen. There was nothing I could do to prevent that from happening. It was in God's hands. It was out of my control. And sometimes when it's so obvious like that, it's easy to give it to the Lord. It still hurts. But it's the small foxes. It's when somebody lies about you. It's when somebody hurts you. It's when somebody abuses you. It's when somebody walks out of your life and hurts you. In the Those are the small foxes that the enemy gets you and he gets under your skin. And that's where he gets you confined. It's like entrapment. The Bible says it's the small foxes that spoil the vine. Yeah. 
And when you're hurt, when somebody does something, instead of having a conversation and dealing with it as Matthew 18 and have that conversation, what do you do? You get spiritual about it. God doesn't want these people in my life. So you start cutting people off. And then all of a sudden, you become an island unto yourself. And that is not what God has intended for your life. Because he said, don't forsake the assembling of the saints. We all need each other for different reasons, but we need things. So things like stress and strife and bickering and arguing can cause a person to hate, to resent, and have unforgiveness, which keeps you confined. You know, whenever you look at miserable people, I can probably tell you and guarantee you at the root of that, is unforgiveness and resentment. And sometimes you don't even know that it's there. You don't even know that it's there. And that's what's scary. A couple of weeks ago, I was invited um, to a funeral. And it was at a place, of a former church, where really I had, I had some horrible, horrible wounds from this place. And I was very um, shocked that I was asked for from, by the family because I thought, you know, they were, part of, they were part of the whole situation that went, went down. And I thought, well, normally I wouldn't have gone because I didn't think I was going to be welcome, but Lord, you're presenting me an opportunity. So what do I do? Because when I'm searching myself, you know, because I know a lot of people said, you know, I thought I forgave. But then somebody mentions their name. And, 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 and right away, I can go right back to that. And I always got a little bit confused. And I'm kind of on the fence. And I'll, and I'll admit it that, you know, sometimes, yeah, you can, you can have forgiven them. But it's just, it, it's a hurt. It's an emotion. But if the hurt and the emotion are still there, it still means that you haven't been completely healed. So I prayed and I really believed that this was an opportunity for me to see if I was truly free. Was I truly clean in my heart? Were my, my, was my heart pure? Were my hands clean? Because I'll tell you something, I'm going after what God has for me. When God told me that he was going to start lifting up things, lifting things off of my life, I said, I'm going to believe you. And I did it as a step of faith. And I went, I went to the church. Janine had come with me. She was part of the whole thing. And we prayed in the car. And we did not know how we were going to be received from everybody. And I walked into that place. And I saw, I mean, it was like, it, you know, it just my, my, my children were dedicated there. I mean, it was just a flood load of memories. I even saw the pastor, and the pastor came up to me and said, uh, I saw you had a woman's thing in, in Lancaster, and wow, it looks like you guys had a great time. And, and I sat there, and I walked out, and I said to Jane, how are you? She goes, I'm fine. She says, how are you? And I said, I'm free. Amen. I'm free. It was such a great day for me. It was such a victory because... All I felt, I felt bad for everybody else. Because I had seen where I was not contained anymore. And for the fact that that pastor had acknowledged that I even had ministry, was his way of saying, I'm sorry I did what I did to you. Because it was so obvious when I walked in that place, and everybody was stunned. Karen? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Because I don't look like what I went through. Amen. You see, when God does something in your life and you come through a battle, you look better than you went into the battle. Yes, I did. See, that's why I was teaching you last week. Stop looking for just 
the victory. The victory is for a moment. God wants you to stay on the battlefield because he wants you to get the spoils. He wants you to get the spoils. Do you know what the word of God, the way God's mind works when somebody steals from you? It says it in Exodus. It's like five to one. They got to give you back what they took. That's in Proverbs, but there's another one in Exodus. God's mind works. They got to give you back what they stole, and then they got to give you five more. Five more. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. People are not worth. And here's the thing. The battle is never with people. People are not your enemy. You fixate. This is a bad person. That's a bad person. This person doesn't need to be in my life. And we get so spiritual about things. And it has nothing to do with people because people are just pawns in the enemy's hand to rob you of a blessing. And if God can give you another chance over and over and over again, how do we justify cutting people out of our life because they made a mistake and not showing them forgiveness? See, these are all the little things in our life that keep us contained, that keep us confined to this little space that we're in right now. Know the people that, that, that you're going to forgive for what they did. No, they don't deserve it. No, they lied on you. They did terrible things to you. And no, they don't deserve forgiveness. But I got news for you. You don't deserve forgiveness either. And God still gave it to you. So let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And guess what? There's nobody in this room. People can make a mistake. I'm cutting them off. I don't put up with that. But you make the same mistake that somebody else did. Accuse somebody, have the wrong perception of something. And then all of a sudden, when you find out that you're wrong, you want that forgiveness. So it's, it's really important that whatever you want, and whatever how you want to be treated, you make sure you treat people like that. Because it will come back. We have an enemy who is very, very strategic. Mm -hmm. There's nothing stupid about Satan. He's smart. He's cunning. And the Bible says that. Nor is the enemy random. He, he is somebody, he sits around with his little militant nymphs and imps and, de and demons. And he says, listen... How do we get her? Where's the trigger points? Where's the trigger points? What's going to upset her? What, what's going to blow her mind? Okay, we, we tried her in her finances. That doesn't work. We tried her in her body. That doesn't work either. She just talks all the more. She just preaches all the more. Let's touch her kids. Okay? There is nothing that is random about your enemy. He is strategic. In the book of Joel... Joseph God tells us that he's going to restore unto us all the years that the locust and the palm worm and the canker worm and the, cap and the caterpillar have eaten. Amen. You know, Amen. every time that I read that scripture, I just kind of thought, oh, that's a good thought. Like everything, all the things that have been eaten away. But I never saw it as Satan's strategic plan on how he gets people. When he says that the, the canker worm and the palm worm and the caterpillar and the locust, these are just not, they're all locusts, okay? But what this is, is strategies and a game plan on how the enemy gets you. The palm worm, the Hebrew word for it is gazam. It is a gnawing locust that targets the fruit. Gazam means to tear away by consistent, consistent nibbling at the fruit. 
You can go outside and you can look at the fruit and at a glance from far away, it looks like it's fine. But these little insects, what happens is it, it nibbles and it gnaws very, very slowly. Again, nothing fast. The enemy never works fast. He does everything slow and strategic and he's very, very methodical about everything he does. The fruit represents, because um, uh, the, the, actually the palm worm, it actually hides and it nibbles away at the fruit. And the fruit represents the reaping of all the sowing that you've done. So listen, if you sow, you're going to reap. So the enemy is after your fruit. Why? Because Jesus said, you know, um, you were my child. You didn't choose me. I chose you and I have ordained you to bring to bear fruit and to bear much fruit and your fruit shall remain. The enemy is after your fruit. Okay? So what he wants to do, and he's a master at gnawing away at you slowly and nibbling away at the blessings of God in your life. And where does it start? It starts by how I see what I'm going through. That victim mentality, that poor me. And he just gets that seed in there and he begins to just gnaw at it and gnaw at it. You know what's interesting about Satan? In Genesis, when we're introduced to him, he's called a serpent. He's called a snake. When you get to Revelation, he's known as the dragon. How does one go from a snake to a dragon? You know why? We gave him that power. We fed him. By giving him too much credit, by believing his lie, and believing his report, and keep repeating it and repeating it and giving credence to it, we made the enemy grow. You guys are quiet, but I'm excited. Okay? So when you talk about the problem over and over again, mm -hmm. you magnify that problem that that problem becomes unconquerable. Mm -hmm. And God himself says, things are impossible with man. Mm -hmm. But nothing, Hallelujah. nothing is impossible with God. Amen. There is nothing that is too hard. That's why you don't have to run. That's why you don't have to settle. That's why you can stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And so what he does is he gnaws at you with disappointment, with discouragement. And when he can disappoint you and he can discourage you, he can depress you. The next he says, the locust. The Hebrew word for locusts are arbe. And this locust, it's a military or a migrating locust. And what this locust does is whatever the palmer worm didn't eat, this one does. And he studies you. He knows your triggers. He knows your buttons. He knows what aggravates you. And he will send those things and those people into your life. He knows how to put something out there that just gets your, your blood going. And what do you do? Bam! You got to go right back and you got to react to it. Instead of looking at it, facing it, and laughing at it. Say, God, I don't care. You got my back. And a lot of times while God is working in your life. And it's always, see this is just the thing. When God is working in your life, the enemy is sure to throw a, you know, a wedge in there. God's doing something. We're moving. We're going in the right direction. And all of a sudden, bam, something happens. And you get pulled out of position. And instead of being on a rock, you find yourself in the mud. Instead of soaring with the eagles, you find yourself in the pig slop. Why? Because you got to get in there and you got to fight. Because you got to prove yourself. Amen. And God's saying, You're my child. Just shut up. 
Come on. That's enough. I put my anointing on you, and when you walk into a, into a building, people will sense that anointing, and your anointing changes the atmosphere. Hallelujah. Whenever you get in, 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 into, the, into a mud fight with a pig, you become a pig. You know, I, I know that that sounds terrible, but it's the truth. Don't ever get into the into the ring with somebody who's ignorant. Listen, I've done that. I've had Facebook book wars with people. <laughs> and then finally, somebody said to me, you know, there is a way that you can block people. And that blocking thing is my best friend. <laughs> because I'm not going to, I'm not going to have an argument with you. Because your argument doesn't even make sense. You're going to yell and scream at me because I posted something? about I don't want drama in my life and I'm gonna leave those things behind and tell me that I'm not of God and that I don't have compassion for God's people in my and, and you know and it was like and you and it's listen everybody has it it's that instinct of I want to protect myself but listen he is my banner of victory he is my God he is my protector I don't care what you say about me I don't care what your opinion is because God has got an opinion of me and the only opinion that really matters at the end of the day it's what God says about you Amen. that's it that's it don't let the enemy have any credence or place in your life that he should not have okay so now there there is um and, and the problem with a lot of these things is you don't even realize that this is happening to you. I mean, I know now I know now you're thinking, you're going, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. Wow, I didn't see that. But this is why I'm shedding this light on you because tomorrow when you wake up, when the enemy tries to throw something to trip you up, you're going to go, oh, this is what you talked about last night. Now I can recognize it. You know what I mean? If you're walking in the dark, you're going to trip over some stuff. But the moment that I can turn a light on for you, you're going to learn something and you're going to be that much wiser going through something so that you don't have to go through the, these, these long, endured processes <laughs> that God sometimes doesn't ordain, but he's got to say, okay, we haven't learned this, so one more lap around the mountain. You know, like, I'm getting old. I don't feel like walking around the mountain anymore. I want to get on the cruise ship and I want to go on vacation and enjoy myself. So if I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching for me. <clears throat> the next the next worm is the canker worm. And this, this the Hebrew for this is yeleg, Y-E-L-E-J. And it means a wingless locust larva. And this is an undetectable worm. Kind of like, it's kind of like a tapeworm in your belly. You can't see it. You know when people go to these foreign countries and they, and they get like a... A parasite or something in their belly and it just eats away and eats and eats and eats and eats and eats and you don't even know that it's there and then all of a sudden one day you are sick you are sicker than sick because of this thing and what happens is is this thing it's designed to hatch it gets inside of you and it hatches and what this does spiritually is it comes against your possibilities before your possibilities even become a reality it nips things in the bud See, if you, look, if you look at a fruit tree, like a pear tree, there's always a bud first, and then it grows into fruit. What this thing does is it kills and it attacks the bud. So while, while you, you got this thing, it's gnawing at you, and then it's, and then it's, it's hatching. This thing, this thing goes after, because if he can cloud you and he can distract you, you're not even thinking of your dream anymore. All you're doing is you're living your life to be able to survive. And God never intended any one of us to just survive. Amen. He has called us to thrive. Amen. He wants us Amen. to thrive. He says, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Yes. So if you see a bud, you will eventually see the fruit. So he kills the fruit. He kills the bud so that the fruit can't grow. That's what disappointment and discouraging is. I've tried this before. I've done this before. But you see, he's gnawed away at you and away at you, and he's just whittled you down. That now you don't even want a dream. You don't even want a new relationship. God is saying, listen, I'm sending a new person into your life. I'm giving you a new opportunity. I'm opening up a door that no man can shut. 
but you're so confined in your hurt because the because these locusts they've been just annoying at you for years and years and years and this is where the bad thinking happens and some of us have got issues and we didn't even realize we have issues because you don't realize how the enemy has been whittling away at your heart and your mind and you've been confined to this place that God said, listen, this was a pit stop. I want to encourage you tonight that wherever you are, it's a pit stop. That's right. That's right. It is not the destination. It's a pit stop. You just, it, it's like taking, all it is, is you're taking a bathroom break. <laughs> you're driving down the Jersey Turnpike, you're on 95, and listen, every couple of hours, what do you got to do? You got to make a pit stop. You got to stretch your legs, you got to go to the bathroom, you got to get a snack, you got to, that's all it is. You can't live at a, at a rest stop. <laughs> You can't do that. They're not built that way. You can't do that. There's no, there's no real nourishment there. there there's snacks, there's <laughs> chips, there's, you, there, there's nothing there. You're not meant to stay there. So God brings you to some places where, listen, this is a difficult place, but we're, but, but we're on a journey here. And the journey is not the destination. You're on a journey to get to the destination. So the enemy will try to kill it before it kills you. It doesn't attack the fruit, but it attacks it. And, and basically what this is, it's undercover activity. He, he's, he's, he's like a spy. Undercover. In disguise. You can't recognize it. And a lot of times what the enemy does is he covers things and makes them look spiritual. <laughs> And he tries to justify you in how you feel. Well, the Lord has just moved me on. <laughs> See, God has never let me do that. Because even after people hurt me, God always puts me in that position that i got to bless my enemies. He will wake me up and make me pray for them. Wish them Merry Christmas. Happy Father's Day, Happy Mother's Day. I'm praying for you. And God, you know, he, he nags at me so that I'm not lying and doing it. Makes me do it. Actually puts a burden in my heart for these people. And sometimes I'll talk to people that are close to me and I'll go, what is wrong with me? <laughs> this thing is like beating a dead horse. I got set free from it, I should walk away from it, and I shouldn't care anymore. I should be doing the happy dance, they're gone. And somebody said to me, because it's really hard to be like Jesus. Amen. And every day, and every day, making you do that. Making you do that. So how does he go undercover? And you see, again, it, it's not, it, it, it's a covert operation. Is that the word for undercover? Yes. Covert, okay. It's not over, it's covert. covert. You, you're undercover. And how do you do this? Biggest thing is unforgiveness. Mm. Come on. Let me tell you something. Unforgiveness, it is something that I, 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 can't, I can't do it. Because it is, it is the one, and I think the strongest thing in your life mm. that will rob you from every blessing that God has for you. Right, wrong, or indifferent, you never have a right to have unforgiveness towards someone. It will eat you like a cancer. And the enemy will make you feel justified in that hate and that resentment. Now listen, there are some situations that restoration is not possible and it might not be a very good idea, okay? Because not everything that is forgiven is reconciled. However, again, you don't really struggle with the bigger things. 
It's the little foxes that spoil the vine, that hold you up. She said that, he said that, he did that. He insulted me, I got offended. <laughs> Your offense will, will totally take you out of position. So many people will leave a church because they got offended. Somebody had to be disciplined and called out on something. And they leave because they were offended. And listen, sometimes some people need to be offended. Because if you're doing, and, 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 here's, and here's the thing too, when somebody has to correct you, it's not because they don't love you. If they didn't love you, they would let you. Go do whatever you want. Give Judas enough rope and let him hang himself and have a party and be done with it. But when somebody truly cares about your soul, take the criticism and be grateful for it. And don't let the enemy rob you of the opportunity and the ability to recognize God in your life. Because if you don't learn how to appreciate the people or the man or the woman that God sends into your life to be tough on you at times, if you don't learn how to appreciate it, you will end up losing it. You will end up losing it. Anything you don't appreciate, you will end up losing and you want to get offended and you want to walk out of a church, you want to walk out of a meeting because you didn't agree with something. Somebody does 20 things right, but there was <laughs> one thing. And all of a sudden you're like, Satan. <laughs> you're Satan, Lee. Are you done? You're done. And meanwhile, what you don't understand, you try to punish the man or the woman or the church or the group. And the only one that you've punished is yourself. Because you've allowed the enemy to work undercover through hate, through resentment, and through unforgiveness, and pull you from your source of power and strength. Now, I know somebody's going to write me and say, my source and my strength is God. <laughs> Absolutely. I am not God, and that's not what I'm saying. But when you're sitting in a church, and it's not just this church, I'm talking any church. Because this, this I'm offended and I'm leaving a church is an epidemic in the body of Christ. Okay? It's all over and everybody's hands are dirty. Okay? Because everybody somewhere along the line got offended at something that was said or done and they walked out and they spiritually justified themselves and they said, God's moved me on. <laughs> and what they don't realize is you just joined the Strife and Stress Club. And you allowed the enemy to pull you out of a place where you were learning, where you were growing, where you were being fed, where God had you covered. That's why he says, don't forsake the assembling of the saints. It's about the worship. It's about the fellowship. But it's also about the covering that a good pastor, a spiritual mother or father, will pray for her spiritual children. He will pray for his spiritual children. We have many teachers and instructors, but we have very few fathers. And if you're in a place that you have somebody who loves you, because you might be a captive and they might be a deliverer, and they're not going to put up. They don't want to hear your pain. They don't want to hear your problem. They know, but they're seeing you as God sees you. And they love you enough to say, stop. Stop majoring in minors. Stop with being a child. It's time to grow up. Come on, pull your big girl panties up and let's move. Time to be a grown-up. Yes, yeah, suck it up, as Karen would say. Time to grow up. 
Because if you don't, you're going to miss what God is doing. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss what God's doing in my life. Amen. 48 years old. I know for some of you, well, you're so young. You know, I, I, but I'd like to come into the palace while I have my own teeth. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Aren't you glad you came out of the back, Sammy? <laughs> so don't let unforgive, you know, unforgiveness, you know, it, it's so detrimental. Don't, don't let that stand in your way. Don't major in minors. Because you know what? When you, you get a dose of reality, okay? When it becomes all about you and poor me, poor me, just take a step back. And just start looking at what other people are going through. Yes. There's a little, there's a little girl Bella that we've been praying for. Um, uh, Debbie Rooney, she's been talking about her on Facebook, and um, this little girl, she's just gone through so many different treatments. She's a white girl, but her skin is completely black right now. She's going through all this radiation, she's going through all this chemo, and as soon as she's done with this, then they got to send her to another children's hospital, and she's got to go through a whole another round of this stuff. And you're worrying about being offended? You're worrying about what somebody said to you? We've got to grow up and understand where this is coming from. This is the enemy trying to pull you out of your power source. Pull you out of your place of peace. And peace doesn't come by cutting people off or being mean or walking away, or running. No, stand there and fight in a godly way. How do we fight in a godly way? Lift my hands and I worship. And I think on the things that are good, pure, and lovely. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, this is the stuff that I'm going to spend my time thinking about. Yeah. I'm not going to think about the minus because all it's going to do is drag me down. It's like eating, it's like eating dead flesh. I'm not a buzzard. I'm an eagle. Why? Because that's what God said about me. And if God said that about me, it doesn't matter what you say about me. Right. God said it about me, and that's what I'm going to believe. Yes. And that's the word I'm going to take. Anybody else have any contradiction or a different opinion about it? I don't care. I'm not putting a survey out there. What do you think of me? I don't want to know. I'll probably need therapy after it. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. It's not important. At the end of the day, can I look in the mirror? Can my, by the grace of God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? Did I do what was right in the eyes of the Lord? Amen. Did I do all I can do, God? I can't, I, I, I cannot be responsible for how people react or what they choose or what they say, but I am responsible for what I do. Amen. So help me grow, God. Create in me a clean heart. Listen, adultery and fornication, that all starts as a bud. It all, it all starts as a thought. Nothing just happens. Okay? Don't him, oh, just, just happen, just the mood. No, nothing just happens. What is Because this is the, the, the plan of Satan. You see something. It's pleasing to the eye. You think about it. You begin to talk to it. It begins to talk back to you. And it grows. And it grows. And it grows. And then the next thing you know, you're in a, you're in a bad situation. You, you're, you're in something that God will forgive you. But the consequences, the consequences of your actions are devastating. Now God can use all of that and turn around, but why go there? Is it worth it? Don't make up a testimony that God didn't actually want you to have. Okay? And what do I mean by that? Living in his permissive will. I know this is wrong, but God will forgive me. I'm just going to go do this anyway. Or we rewrite the word of God to suit and justify what we want. It's a really bad idea. 
you remember this. Whatever you feed is going to grow. Relationships, finances, your health, whatever it is. Whatever you feed, it is going to grow. Whatever you starve is going to die. So you've got to take the things of God in your life. If you want to bust out of this, this thing that you're in, the things that God has ordained, the things that God has spoken, you need to feed those things. You need to think on it. You need to meditate on it. You need to, to live it, to do it. And ask the Holy Spirit every day to help you get better at it. But those other things that are in your life, the negativity, the fear, the doubt, the hurt, the resentment, you need to starve those things. Give it to the Lord. If you got to go to therapy, because there are some things, listen, there are some things that you will go through in life that just... You can't pray things away. There are some things that go down so deep and so dark. You've got to go to therapy. You've got to get somebody to help you show what's wrong. Because sometimes there could be something wrong and you don't even know that it's wrong. Because your, your norm has been so dysfunctional that you don't know you have a dysfunctional norm. You can have thinking... Well, this is the way my family did it. This is the way my father did it. My grandfather did it. My mother did it. My grandmother and my great-grandmother. This is how, you know, this is our family. And you might not understand or realize, uh, excuse me, no. <laughs> this is not, this is not, this is not healthy. You might not recognize it. So go get yourself some help. Go get yourself some help. And there's no shame in that. But if you're going to be in therapy for 35 years, you might consider... Change it up. <laughs> okay? Because anything that you do, it's, it's, it's got to move in the right direction. So I'm not, I, I am not being insensitive. I'm not telling you, just pray it away and just believe and Put it out of your mind. Put it out of your mind. Put it out. There are some things that you can't put out of your mind. Because they've been so rooted in your life that they hurt and you make decisions based on those feelings. And as a child of God, you cannot live by your feelings. You have to live by the word of God. But sometimes it's hard to accept the word of God when you've got mommy issues, you've got daddy issues, you've got all kinds of issues with other people. And sometimes you don't even think you have an issue until somebody points your issue out to you. But once you learn that you have an issue, you gotta deal with it. You gotta deal with it and you gotta give it to God and, and walk through that process. But we've got to learn how to grow up and deal with this and deal with it in a mature way so that the locusts can't eat anymore. Did this help you tonight? Yes. I mean, did, did the light bulb go on and do you start recognizing and start seeing how subtle the enemy is and how he works? He's never going to throw you into a burning building. He's never going to be obvious with how he's trying to trip you up. And now, now that we learned how he works, you know, in the coming weeks we're going to talk about how to break it. And how, and how to, you know, I mean, how many feel like, you know, you got like a glass, a, a glass ceiling above you? Like, I've gone this far, but I just, I can't, I can't, I can't break through it. But you know what? We, we had to lay down the foundations that we did, you know, all the year when you think about the teachings, the soul ties, the, you know, the, the weights, just the, the orphan spirit, everything, because we've been just whittling away and whittling away and whittling away so that now we can get to this place where now I know what I'm fighting. Now, now I'm strong enough. Now I know what I'm fighting. Now I know what the problem is. Because sometimes it's hard to conquer an enemy when you don't know who the enemy is. And listen, the Bible talks about, um, you know, when the thief is caught, you got to catch the thief, which means you got to know who the thief is. If you don't know who the thief is, you can't catch him. And if you can't catch him, you can't get your stuff back. 
Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Amen. We're going to get ready to take offering tonight.